This video is going to be about confidence intervals of a single mean. I'd like you to pause the video and read this um, fairly entertaining Garfield comic strip. To get an idea of what we are going to talk about in this video, please see your textbook Biostat and the following subsections, 4.2.1 and 4.2.2. Uh, the book Modern Dive, again, provides a very good conceptual understanding to these topics. If you look at Modern Dive, the textbook, the online textbook found in the syllabus, uh, section 8.3. Uh, Modern Dive goes into some other stuff that we're not going to be covering in this class in chapter 8. So really, I just want you to get the flavor for confidence intervals via 8.3. Okay, here's what's entertaining about this comic strip from a statistical perspective, which you might as well hear as taking all of the fun out of the comic. Garfield's weatherman is forecasting tomorrow's temperature, high temperature. Instead of giving a single estimate, like a single sample mean sort of guess, he is casting a net or she is cast. They are casting a net. They are casting, the weather person is casting a net so wide that it's uninformative. The idea with confidence intervals is we want to cast a net, but we don't want our net to be so wide as to be uninformative. What we want to do is trade width for giving up some degree of accuracy or some degree of certainty. That is our goal with confidence intervals. In order to estimate a population mean, like tomorrow's high temperature, instead of guessing a single number, like a sample mean, we want to provide a confidence interval. That is a lower bound and an upper bound, much narrower than 40 below zero and 200 above, recognizing that in order to make our interval narrower, we're going to have to give up some accuracy. And that's a trade-off we are generally willing to accept. So we are going to make a density plot of original data. We're going to start with the penguins data set, because I haven't used it so much, and the variable bill length. And I think they even include the units in the variable name, which is a huge no-no, uh, if you ask me personally. So let's go find that data set. I'm going to suggest you, let's see, can I zoom in on this? Yeah, look at that. I'm going to suggest you go to uh, github.com forward slash Raldi's forward slash data. And if you pull that up, I have a data set somewhere down here named penguins, which you can read about in the help file. For the most part, we're going to use the variable bill length which is the length of the bill of these penguins in millimeters. And we're going to try to estimate the mean bill length of these Palmer penguins. OK, so let's jump. Oh, wait, no, I missed something. Let's jump into the data set itself. Where did my penguins go? Here we go. I'll click on the CSV file. And then in order to get the URL for this penguins data set, I will click on the button raw. I will copy that URL. And in R, I'm going to name my data set penguins and use the function read.csv. And inside the parentheses, we'll specify in double quotes the URL that contains the data set. And indeed, Penguins shows up as a data frame inside R as we want. The variable we're going to be interested in is bill length. It's in millimeters. And the unfortunate part about this data set, which makes it great for the example I'm about to give you, is there is missing data. That's what this NA means. It means data not available for the fourth penguin in this data set. That's a frustrating reality of real world data. So we're just going to have to deal with it. So our first step was to use the library ggplot2 to make a ggplot of the dataset penguins. And on the aesthetics of the x-axis, we're going to put the bill length in millimeters. And we want a density plot, since this is a single numerical variable. 
you'll now know what this warning means from ggplot. It's essentially saying there was two missing observations in the data set. It doesn't know how to plot data that isn't there, so it threw them out, but it told you it did so, which is good, despite the warning message making you think you did something wrong. So here is the original uh, data of bill length represented as a distribution. This density plot is estimating the population distribution of bill lengths of these Palmer penguins. Now, there's almost this bimodal thing going on here in that there's two humps in this data set, which is suggesting that although the data look relatively symmetric, they don't appear to be perfectly normal. Nonetheless, we are going to apply the central limit theorem to estimate the sample uh, to estimate the population mean bill length using the sample mean of the bill lengths. And despite the fact that the population does not look normal, the central limit theorem tells us that the sampling distribution of the sample mean will be approximately normal. So, we have made it thus far up to, we have recommended, whoops, here we go. We have recommended which sections to read. We've provided a motivating example, and we've made an original density, a density plot of our original numeric variable bill length. So we're recognizing we are going to estimate a population parameter from the distribution that the density plot of bill length is estimating. Next, we're going to see if we can actually plot via the central limit theorem uh, or plot the central limit theorem justified distribution of the sample mean. Let's see if we can do that in R. So uh, first we need to calculate the sample mean, mu hat, is really easily done with the function named mean using the data frame penguins and extracting with the dollar sign operator the numeric variable bill length. Now this is going to give us an error message right away because of these missing data, but I'm not going to fix it without showing you first what the issue is. Notice that mu hat comes up as not available. Because there are those two missing observations in this ver uh, numeric variable, the function mean doesn't know what to do with them you have to explicitly tell R to remove those observations that are NAs. This argument here, which stands for remove NAs, I don't know why you have to read it backwards, but you do, that's just a quirk of R, tells you to remove the NAs before you calculate the sample mean. So here is mu hat, our best guess from the data we have about the mean beak length of the population. I don't know, maybe it's something like right there. What we're also going to want is the standard error of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Now, remember, that's going to depend on two pieces, sigma hat, which we can calculate with the function sd in R, and again, we'll calculate it on the same variable as before. And because of the missing data, we will remove those observations before we calculate the estimated standard deviation. Now, here comes the tricky part because of those missing data. We can very easily figure out how many rows there are in the data frame penguins, 344. But those missing observations should not be calculated in your sample size because you threw them out from the calculation of your sample mean and sample standard deviation. So instead, what you should do is ask is.na on the vector that you're interested in. Now, this is going to return a vector of trues and falses. I'm going to print out just the first six so we can see what's going. Sorry. I'm going to print out just the first six as long as I correctly spell the variable name just so we can see what's going on. 
Notice the first one is not a missing observation. The second one is not a missing observation. The third one is not a missing observation. The fourth one finally is a missing observation. Remind yourself of that by printing out the first six rows of the original data frame penguins like we did earlier. Now we're going to somehow use these trues and falses to calculate the number of observed values that are not missing. In R, you can take these trues and falses and flip them. That is, for each false, make it true, and for each true, make it false, simply by adding that exclamation point before this vector. So here is a vector, and if you add an exclamation point before it, it will flip false to true and true to false. So it negates the vector it prepends. And again, I'm just going to print out the first six. So you can see that false went to true, false went to true, false went to true, true went to false, false went to true, false went to true. This now counts for us where all the trues are ones and all the falses are zeros, the number of actual observations we have in the data set. So watch this. Instead of head, we can just put sum. And indeed, we have 342 observed values, whereas instead, the original data frame had 344 rows. We know that for this variable specifically, there are two missing data points. And indeed, that's how many rows were thrown out by ggplot originally. So here is our calculation for our sample size. OK, what we're inevitably trying to get at, though, is the standard error. And that is just going to be sigma hat, our sample standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size. Those are two, uh, those are like three calculations we need in order to make, via the central limit theorem, the sampling distribution of the sample mean. So here we go. I'm just going to hit up until I recover the plot for the original data. Now remember, this layer here is representing the population distribution of bill lengths. What I'm going to add to this plot is, just like we saw in the Applied Central Limit Theorem video, we're going to add a distribution function. Because the central limit theorem tells us that the normal distribution is, uh, tells us that the sampling distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal, I'm just going to use the normal distribution, even though in all the calculations from here forward, we'll use the t distribution. It just turns out the t distribution is a little finicky to deal with right here. So I'm going to specify some arguments where the mean is equal to mu hat and the standard deviation is equal to the standard error. That is the distribution of the normal should have a standard deviation that is approximately our calculation for the standard error. Now, this is a meaningless plot, which is why it doesn't, well, it's not a meaningless plot. This is a very informative plot. But it doesn't show up in the world of statistics very often, despite the fact that this represents what is actually going on better than most plots you see out there. The problem is, you, as long as you understand this plot, you should be able to do something better. You can and we will once we get a good understanding of this plot. This relatively flat line with these two little humps here is actually the distribution, uh, the density plot of the distribution of the bill lengths. This is the original data right here, this very kind of flat line. What's happened is when we put a representation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean of bill lengths on this plot, it's so tall, the sampling distribution for the sample mean of bill lengths, it's so tall that it's kind of scaled off the rest of the distribution. What's happened is our sample size is so large 
that it made the sampling distribution of the sample mean very narrow. Remember, as your sample size goes up, your uncertainty will go down. And when your uncertainty goes down, it shrinks. It makes more narrow the sampling distribution for the sample mean. So what we're seeing here is that we are very confident about where the sample mean for bill length should, where the population mean for bill length should be. It should be somewhere right around 44. It's from this sampling distribution that we create the idea of a confidence interval. That idea of like a net that can capture the true population mean with some certainty comes from this sampling distribution. So let's draw some pictures on pen and paper before we get back into R here. So we have now done this step. We have represented through the central limit theorem the distribution of the sample mean. The, sample, the distribution of the sample mean captures possible values of the population mean. That is through the sampling distribution of the sample mean. OK, so let's just draw the sampling distribution of the sample mean. What we have is basically just something that looks approximately normal, is centered at mu hat, which is equal to, let's just double check, 44, let's call it 43.9. We're just going to call it 44 for now. And has a standard error of, let's just double check, 0.3. So I just like to write that right there. So what we're going to do is use an idea related to those quantiles that we saw before from applying the central limit theorem. We want to go under this distribution and find a lower bound, and under this distribution and find an upper bound such that between these two values is some percent of the distribution. We often choose 95%. So we would like to go to the distribution that represents all the likely values for the population mean bill length of these Palmer penguins and find two values that captures basically 95% of the area under the sampling distribution for the sample mean. With that, we will have an interval that gives up all the area in the tails because all that area in the tails stretches out to positive and negative infinity. And we don't want an interval so wide that it's uninformative. What we want to do is give up all of this area in the tails sacrifice that 5% of the area under the curve such that we have a very likely to be true interval that captures the population mean bill length of these Palmer penguins. The way we do this is through a very, it's intuitive once you get the idea, but it's a little difficult to understand at first a very sim seemingly simple formula. So this formula here, I guess, deserves its own page. Let's go do it. So the way this formula works is you start with mu hat, that's our number 44, and then you add and subtract to it this value t star that we'll get to next, times the standard error. These two numbers, the mu 
these two numbers are calculated from the sampling distribution for the sample mean. This number is where the sampling distribution for the sample mean is centered. And this number is that average square distance from the mean. That's the standard deviation of this sampling distribution for the sample mean, which we call the standard error. This T star value is the value that tells us how far out into the tails to capture 95% of the area under the curve. We actually saw that in the applied central limit theorem video. What we saw was you can find two values. This one will be negative T star and this one will be positive T star because despite my picture, the T distribution is perfectly symmetric. So if you go some distance to the left and some distance to the right from the center, then you can capture whatever percent area you want in the distribution, under the distribution. And we often want to capture 95%. That's just kind of the standard number to go with in the world of statistics. We will explore different numbers later on, but for now, let's just stick with 95%. So what we want to do is use the function in our QT to find the percentiles that put 95% of the area in between whatever two numbers these are. We want to find T star such that we can get 95% of the area under the curve. Well, if you recall, quantiles are defined by area to the left. So area to the left would be 0 0.25. And up here, we'd have 0 0.025. But if we have 0 0.025 to the right of this value T star, then we have 95% and 0.025% to the left of positive T star. So we can use these two values to get out positive and negative T star. And then we got to specify our degrees of freedom for a single mean as sample size minus one. Let's try this in R. It should be less intimidating than it looks on pen and paper because we've already seen these calculations in a previous video where they didn't seem that intimidating. Okay, look at this. This is your value negative T star, and this is your value positive T star. Those are the values you're going to multiply by in the formula we have to calculate a confidence interval. So we now have a value to plug in for T star. I guess I did that a little backwards, huh? Let's write it out like this. The value negative 1.96 all the way up to the value positive 1.96 is the value that gives you 95% of the area under the appropriate sampling distribution for the sample mean. So lucky for us, we have all of these values already calculated in R such that the formula here looks very similar to the original formula I gave you on pen and paper. So here is our 95% confidence interval for the population mean of bill lengths for Palmer penguins. I'm going to interpret this and tell you what that interpretation means in another video. But for now, Let's see if we can just 
put up on the screen all the calculations we need in order to repeat an example like this because I'd like you guys to put your own example in your course notes. And hopefully when we see it all on the screen in front of us, it won't be that bad. There you go. That is, despite the length of this video, sorry, they're getting a little long. These topics are a little abstract and a little tough to deal with sometimes. That is the complete code for a working example of calculating a 95% because that's the amount of area between these two numbers, like represented by here and here. 95% confidence interval for the population mean bill length for Palmer penguins. I will pick up this example in another video, interpret that confidence interval with a, the standard phrase we use in the world of statistics, and then I'm going to try to explain to you what that sentence means, what that standard phrase common to statistics actually means.